everyone. I see we've got uh, some of the same uh, attendees as uh, in our shade selection, which is wonderful. Give me one moment. I just need to make sure that we're set up. Give me one second. Okay, well, unfortunately, we can't see Dr. Berenstein, but we can hear him, which is great. So, Dr. B, we can hear you. We well, can't see you. There's something that's wrong. The important with part. Sorry? That's definitely the important part. Yes, yes. So, uh, thank you all for joining us. Um, and I know some of you were with us for our last uh, shade selection presentation with Gordana. So, it's nice that you have uh, moved over and joined us over here. Um, so, I'm just going to jump right in. Um, and last time I, I didn't introduce myself in our, in our last presentation yesterday, so I will do it today before I introduce Dr. Berenstein. So my name is Maya Saratlich. It's nice to virtually meet you all. Uh, I'm the managing director here at the lab at Gordana Dental Art Studio. So I am your point person for, you know, communications at the lab. Um, I'm the one who's bugging you and seeing, you know, how things are going. And if you need anything, I, I'm involved in production. Uh, all the communication. I also um, work with a lot of our dentists with regards to marketing. I have an advertising background. Um, so, you know, if anybody ever has any questions of that sort, uh, I'm definitely here to help uh, with that. Um, and so enough about me that we're here to listen to Dr. Berenstein. Um, so for those of you that don't know him, um, Dr. Berenstein is a graduate of the University of Toronto and received his specialty training in prosthodontics in Houston, Texas. He completed his residency at Sick Kids Hospital, um, and he was the founding president um, of the Ontario Study Club for Osteointegration and Plant Dentistry. He is a past president of the Association of Prosthodontists of Ontario. He recently retired and sold his private practice, which we at the lab were very sad about since we, Gordana, worked with him for, I believe, over 35 years, I think almost 40. Uh, but we're really excited at the opportunity to work with him in a different capacity, um, in an educational capacity. So, you know, one of them is uh, holding lectures like this one. Um, but also, uh, you know, we'll be having more lectures with him that are going to be, in, you know, a range of... Uh, of topics and also the most exciting one is uh, that we'll be working with him to provide dentists with one-on-one -on -one guidance for uh, patient uh, appointments. So for, you know, we've got a patient room here at the lab and we're happy to have you come to the lab and schedule an appointment with, uh, with Dr. Berenstein and Gordana will be there as well. And it can be for a patient consultation. It can be for, you know, a preparation uh, appointment and he'll be there side, side by side with you walking you through your appointment or a consultation. Um, so we're, we're happy to uh, be offering that very soon um, in, our, in our new facility that we have here. Our, our patient room uh, doesn't, uh, we just need to make some minor tweaks to be able to see patients for um, preparation type uh, appointments, but for everything else, we're ready to go. So uh, we can, um, we can talk more about that at a later time. Um, Aside from that, Dr. Berenstein, uh, what else can I tell you about you? You're still teaching, he is still part of the community as he teaches at University of Toronto in the Prostodontic Graduate Clinic. Uh, and he's been doing porcelain veneers for over 25 years, right from the onset of when they were first launched by Avatar. So with that, Dr. Berenstein, I will pass it, uh, pass it over to you. And I will open the presentation for you. Yeah, go ahead and put up that first slide. And, I will, and they, somebody was asking um, how long I will be talking. Oh yeah, about, till about two, I would say, including questions. <clears throat> I think that will be fine, depending on how, how uh, diverted I get when I start talking about, about my favorite topic. Um, just to add to what Maya was saying, I did um, graduate from Prosto in Texas, in, in Houston in, in 82. But you know, and in, in if you look back to 1982, things have changed rather rapidly and, and, and changed for the better. But I can tell you that in 1982, 83, we started doing implants in our office on Bathurst Street. And that was, that was an amazing, and fantastic, exciting experience to start doing the, the, the implants. So since 82, we've been changing and, and innovating and adding uh, materials and 
just becoming better and better at it. <clears throat> um, and I'm talking about all of dentistry, not, not just my, not just uh, our office. Um, you know what, I'm just going to add, sorry, Dr. Berenstein, but um, this is this veneer fundamentals lecture uh, for those of you that will be, you know, somebody who's logging off right at two, we're going to be having a much more in-depth lecture on mastering porcelain veneers at the lab. Uh, it'll be virtual as well, and we'll have uh, spots for a few people to, uh, to actually join us in person, but that will be a much more in-depth, um, longer presentation that will have CE credits associated with them. So. Yes, and, and my, at that time, we go over the, the very details of how to do some veneers, the actual technique. I'm not planning to talk about technique uh, this afternoon. I just want to make a presentation about the generalities and the fundamentals. And as I was alluding to, when we started in 82, uh, with the implants, how, how fantastic and, and wonderful experience that was. And then the next big wonderful experience was veneers, veneers. You know, up until 82 and the implants, everybody was talking about TMJ. TMJ was a big hot topic. Even when I was in Houston, it was a big hot topic. But as soon as implants came in, it became implants. And as soon as veneers came in, it became veneers. And now, now, well, it's still still implants, but veneers are um, just a, a wonderful, wonderful treatment when done properly, really. And and you have to know the limitations that you can that you have with veneers too, but we'll get into that. But the fundamentals, I want to go through the fundamentals of case selection, preparation temporization, and very, very important, very, I, I can't tell you, no matter how well you prepare the tooth and treat your patient and understand your patient and the patient's desires and needs, uh, if you don't have a lab technician that can pull it off, uh, you've got nothing, you've got nothing. So an experienced lab is the best. Uh, the best support you can have. So just to go on with the fundamentals, I have a list here of the fundamentals and um, I'll run through that list pretty quickly and then we'll show you some examples. <clears throat> In every prosthodontic uh, endeavor, a posterior stable occlusion is of the highest importance. No, it's okay, she can stay. We can do it that way. We'll go one by one. It's all right. Uh, in this case, you see an obvious need for veneers on five front teeth. And you see a uh, rehab done in the back in the posterior with uh, fixed bridge work. And <clears throat> I actually neglected to mention this yesterday, but I was thinking about it. Uh, if you don't, I'm not talking about partial dentures here. I'm talking about fixed fixed work. You, you, a partial denture uh, in the posterior is not gonna be sufficient to protect and manage. Um, okay, we can take that off. You, you have to have a, a stable posterior, tray, not a partial denture, uh, real teeth and plenty of them, plenty of them. The patient, um, when you've determined the nature of the patient's occlusion and the actual characteristic of the patient, what type of patient is this? A nervous patient? Is this a bruxer? Is this patient bruxing at night? Um, th this is so important. And this is a very nice photo of the 3D printed thermoplastic night guards. And this is very important. And these people, I can say that one of the criteria for me going ahead with, with, with uh, veneers for, for patients is to have them willing to wear a night guard. And, and a lot of them 
truthfully, they are already wearing night guards. And this is the very best way of making them, 3D printed thermoplastic material. So these are all 3D printed, designed and 3D printed in our lab. Yeah, printed in the lab, yeah. It's, I mean, you can make them other ways, yes, but this is the best way to make them. And they work. Um, anterior guidance, let's call this anterior guidance. And what I'm saying here is, uh, in this particular case, this is uh, six veneers on the upper anteriors. And this, this young lady does have cuspid guidance. I'm not sure if that's her true cuspid guidance or I just had her move out into lateral excursion. But of course, the, um, the lower cuspid should be involved uh, in that, not the bicuspid, but I don't remember if there's a malocclusion in this case or not. But the, the point is, and I don't want to go into the details, I will go into the details at another lecture, but the very, and you have one by, one by six upper anteriors done. <clears throat> if you're not careful, that lateral incisor, which is the smallest and the weakest of the group, uh, will often get clipped off at the edge. And um, if you're not careful with your um, design, okay? The design of the anterior guidance. But uh, I won't go into more details. If you go to here's well, here's a case that would be like the most wonderful case you ever had a chance to do. And if you could get one like this, uh, this would be your best first case. <laughs> and uh, not only did we have a chance to build out that right lateral uh, just by adding um, a, a veneer to it and veneering the other three anteriors. Uh, there's no uh, vertical overlap, and there's a great deal of horizontal overlap. So in that case, um, you don't have to be too involved in the technicalities of anterior guidance, and you get a wonderful case. This particular chap is a lawyer. How he was able to be a lawyer with these teeth, I don't know, meeting people, but he did change them, and he and then he did get hit with a hockey puck <clears throat> and he wasn't wearing a guard at the time. And that's another thing. These, all these people should not only be willing to wear a night guard, they can take their night guard and wear it as a sports guard. And, that, <laughs> and that's very, very important. Not just from getting hit by a puck uh, or a ball, but <clears throat> Where was I going with that? Uh, not just by getting hit with a puck or a ball or whatever, squash is another one that would get you. But when you clamp your teeth down together tight, you know, and bang them and smack them together, that can be, that can be a problem too, especially if it's off center. Anyway, these, these guards and, and night guards and sports guards are very important for these reconstructions. <clears throat> and this is a type of vertical overlap, and you can see the type of, uh, of problem that you might run into if you were trying to veneer these teeth. And in this particular gentleman's case, he <clears throat> badly wanted his space closed. And although I have done it with veneers in special cases, because you can move, they don't see me, but you can move everything mesially you can move those laterals measly, the cuspids measly, and you can close the space pretty much, but then you have, you have height problem because you have to have length and patients have to be willing to, to undergo a lot of treatment. Now this, I'm not gonna show this whole case, although I will show it uh, in another meeting. Uh, this, we did orthodontics here and we did periodontal surgery here and we got uh, an amazing, amazing change uh, for the better for this chap, yeah. And uh, as I was alluding to just now, patients need to be able to um, uh, have crown length and submit themselves to making the case perfect. Because if, if they want to make the case perfect, and most people do, um, 
you have to do crown lengthening quite often. And you can see in the top photo, the um, gingiva is showing in the smile and the big smile. And she did have a very big smile, but just the same after crown lengthening, um, we did veneer uh, 10 teeth for her, maybe 12, I forget. Anyway, well, like I say, I'm not going into details of each one of these types of procedures, but I will at a later date. Um, her teeth were not big enough and bright enough and white enough. For my sake, she could have stopped her treatment right there, but she didn't. So we did do the 12 veneers for her. And um, she came in second in the Miss Canada contest that year. <laughs> second, okay. It was because oh. of the veneers. Mm -hmm. It was because of the veneers. Right, right. <laughs> yes, of the veneers, maybe. That is a young lady uh, represents, these teeth represent uh, a challenge, uh, size of the teeth again. And uh, these teeth can be beautifully managed in the young age group. Because um, she, I think she was maybe 18, 19, 20, something like that. Maybe even younger. And um, we did, uh, I think, uh, six veneers for her. And again, I don't have the, not showing the whole case, but all I'm showing is the possibilities um, that you of of doing wonderful things for people, and I'm showing you that the size of teeth has to be taken into consideration because you don't want to wind up with gigantic teeth. You know there are there are techniques for doing no prep veneers. Maybe we move on. It says. And the next, oh no, okay, I, I won't jump ahead. I, I won't jump ahead, but biotype, okay, no, no, go ahead, go ahead. Uh, biotype is also very, very important. And, and you can see the difference between this biotype on your right and the one on your left it is a thin, uh, receded type of biotype, and this on the right is a thick, heavy keratinized tissue. Very, very big difference in managing these um, these cases. Um, and the the difference is is how you prepare the tooth, how you retract the gingiva, how much you retract the gingiva. And th these are critical to preventing post-operative recession. You don't want to have post-operative recession. And because then, you know, people are very, very uh, fussy about this. They go home and they get out their five-time magnification mirror, especially the ladies. And they will sit there and look at their teeth and uh, they're looking for perfection. And uh, when you do multiple veneers, you have that possibility of making it perfect. Really, especially with the wonderful uh, laboratory backup and the new materials that we have. So <clears throat> preparation is extremely important. And like I say, this is not the, <clears throat> time venue to go over that. But if I could get you excited about doing veneers after learning the technique, you will really, uh, it, it's a tremendous feeling of satisfaction. So as, a, as I was starting to mention, there are uh, different views on the type of preparation you should use for veneers. And, and there, there are legitimate differences. Um, the whole idea of veneers, again, was the quality of the enamel. If you have very good quality enamel and you have a little bit of thickness of enamel after you do your prep and there's some enamel left there, <laughs> the bonding is, is superb. 
uh, to that enamel, <clears throat> and maybe a minimal type of preparation is, is good, but really I have found over the years in doing the veneers, the teeth are filled, the teeth are uh, dark, the teeth are spaced, and you have to have more of a preparation. And the type of preparation I use is a reverse three-quarter crown, <clears throat> where the margins of the mesial distal are hidden and the incisal edge is protected. Um, and we do that more or less, depending on the aesthetic requirement, as, as, uh, depending not so, not so much the aesthetic requirement, but the, um, the functional requirement in, in anterior uh, guidance, and lateral guidance, et cetera, et cetera. No prep veneers can work, um, <clears throat> but there's a very, very, very special case comes by once in a while that you can do a no prep veneer. And even when I do a no prep veneer, I still do a, a minimal prep for uh, the um, finish lines. For the finish lines. And, you know, unlike California, which really went crazy with the no prep veneers, and so many people have huge white teeth, very, very big white opaque teeth. And um, it's almost as if they were, the patient was photoshopped, had their teeth photoshopped, and that's what they have. And uh, that's not a look that I've ever been. Uh, I'm trying to achieve for people, although, and this is very important, that when you interview the patient and you find out, try to find out what that patient is thinking and what that patient would like and what the, the lifestyle that that patient has, then you, you really may have to tailor your, your treatment. For example, has the patient had... Uh, Botox, fillers, you know, lip fillers and facelifts and this sort of thing. There's a different patient to the patient you're looking at right now on the screen. This patient just had- Always do diagnostic wax. Yeah, oh yeah, we'll get to that, oh yeah. Um, this patient, I, in this, this particular slide will show you the type of set, uh, preparation that I do for the most part. It's a minimal reduction. As you can see, that is a lot less reduction than you would use for a crown, <clears throat> a full crown. The whole lingual is untouched, just the labial, interproximals, and over the incisal edge, and all the porcelain that is put on there, um, I'll say porcelain, but it usually is Emacs material, but maybe veneered with porcelain. But that's right. Yes. Yeah. yeah. So, and um, they have they have to be fully fully supported to to uh, stand up, and that that happens to be a pretty good slide to show, and a good biotype. You can see a very thick gingiva, good biotype for for that that type of case. And that's a, a, a fella, as you can maybe tell, that's a fella. Um, so I think one of the big, big problems we had at the very beginning of doing veneers, we, we were trying to uh, do them without having to make, um, having to make temporaries. So we would just do a very, very minimal uh, treatment and send them home. But, but that didn't last long because we found we really couldn't do a lot of cases that way. So we developed a technique for doing temporaries. And there are different uh, ways of doing temporaries, of course. And uh, the, the, the most common way that I used to do them before high tech came into vogue was simply with a Skinner or a template, is that the next slide, Maya? But yeah, either with a, uh, an acrylic clear, like an, like an Essex, um, and these can be lab processed. If you have a vacuum form in your office, you can make them in your office. We made them in the office. 
and often <clears throat> Gordana would make us a, <clears throat> on the lower slide there, that's a, um, yeah, silicone putty. And they're very, the silicone putty is very, very accurate. I mean, it's really, really the, the result with the silicone putty is actually better than the result with the, with the suck down um, template. Let's go back one slide, Maya. And um, yeah, and the material that I use in the office is, and you can mark this down, it's a new outline. It's a PMMA type of acrylic, but it's fortified with a composite in it. So it doesn't change um, color. It's easy to work with once you've done a few. It sets slowly and it comes in multiple colors. And often we would blend colors with this. So this uh, is a very, very good material. It's a little more expensive than the regular acrylics that you use for temporaries, but it's very, very, very good. Uh, so that's what we use for um, ordinarily done in, in the office in the, at, at Chairside or at, um, we have them uh, pressed in the laboratory, but more recently in the last few years, we're doing them as digitally designed and digitally milled temporaries. So <clears throat> what you can do for your patient after you've, you've established your photos and <clears throat> you're agreed on doing the case and you will get a, a, a wax up um, and a digitally and digitally done wax up, I must say. It's not, they're not doing it by, by hand anymore. They're doing it on the computer. And, um, and the great thing about this is, sorry to interrupt, is you know, when we digitally design these diagnostics, we email them to our doctors and you can give us feedback before you even you know, get the physical model. So you can let yeah. us know, you know, change this, make this longer, this shorter, and we'll get it to a place where you're happy with. And then we 3D print the model and send it to you with a, you know, a silicone matrix or putty, uh, or we'll mill them in the lab. So whatever kind of preference a uh, doctor has, but you know, whatever we di digitally design, the temporaries will look you know, exactly that way. The milling in the um, in the lab is just an outstanding procedure, <clears throat> and not only that, after you've shown the patient the design that you're going to use and the, what they were like before, what they're going to be like after, and including the color and everything can be shown to the patient on a screen. And there's nothing better than that. And then you say, well, okay, this shorter, shorter, wider, whatever you want to change. And then, then they're digitally milled from that exact uh, picture that, you, that she's seen, uh, that the patient has seen. So, and they show up in your office the day you're going to start the preps. Now, um, very often you will, have to reline those preps a little, those those a little bit, or fit them a little bit. It's not a terrible chore, but uh, but it is very easy on the patient when you do it this way. Of course, when you do it uh, chair side from scratch, you know there's heat and there's uh, acid and there's problems that affect the gingiva. So this is a this is the way to go when you're doing cosmetic dentistry. A uh, fees should not be a big problem. If their fee is going to be a big problem, I guess it depends on how badly you want to do the case. But take your crown prep, your crown treatment, and add to that 20%. And that should be your fee for veneers. It's cosmetic dentistry and that's and, and, and you will work for that 
extra 20%, believe me. You should just ask around what Botox costs, what fillers cost, what facelifts cost. And you will understand that the type of type of uh, patient you're, you're talking about. Um, so let's go back to uh, laboratory. And um, certainly Gordana is very willing and uh, I'm even willing to uh, be involved in a consultation before proceeding. <clears throat> and um, at that time, shade selection can be done. And you can talk about, get an idea about what the patient expects. Because sometimes the patients have higher expectations for the result and perhaps even for a change in their life for getting these veneers on their teeth. So you have to really know who you're dealing with before you start. And especially if you have a trusted uh, laboratory technician you can work with who's willing to uh, put in that extra time, uh, you'll, get, you'll get great results. Um, yeah, high quality digital design software is here at the lab and uh, hardware, all the, the latest, latest and best hardware is here at the lab. I would advise anybody who's really interested in this work to come to the lab because it, it, is, a, it's, it is a remarkable um, change that has happened in, in dentistry. <clears throat> This is just uh, one before and after slide that we happen to put in. <clears throat> and you can see there's trouble with composites done interproximately over the years and staining and twisted teeth that were not uh, exactly straight. There's always a little shadow in there between the two centrals. And then uh, putting the veneers on, you get a very natural look. You get rid of the shadow in between, and that beautiful smile like that and a natural look. Okay, so that's really all I have to say about that. Um, I did make myself some notes uh, to add in. And after Gordana's lecture, I wanted to, I don't know if we talked about it or not, but with veneers, you don't have the advantage of doing a trial cementation. We did do trial cementations at the very beginning of doing them many, many years ago. But uh, and even even with the um, even with the Emacs crowns, and I don't think at that time they were Emacs; they were a different Emperor. one. They were Empress crown, and you had to cement those. They never did get the very, very strong um, strength. They didn't get strength until they were cemented. So if you put them with temporary cement, uh, from time to time, we'd have a broken one within a week. So with the cosmetic dentistry, crowns, I would strongly advise trial cementing the new materials, especially the, uh, the new Emacs and the uh, zirconium. I never had any breakage uh, in, during trial cementing. Um, but you cannot trial cement veneers. Maybe you could do it for a few hours <laughs> because they're going to come off, uh, and they're going to be—it's going to be a problem. I don't trial cement veneers, so you have to be very, very confident when you're cementing, and that—that that whole process of cementing a veneer is complicated because you have to determine the color of your cement. And you have trial cements to try, but it, it is a tricky. And I will, like I say, I would love to go into that with everybody with the proper slides and everything, but we're not trying to do that today. We're only trying to wet your whistle and uh, 
make you interested in doing some veneers, understanding some of the, the problems that can arise. So we'll open up to questions. And just before we do, um, you know, you see it here on the slide, we're going to be offering a more in-depth lecture, which I mentioned at the beginning. Um, for, but for those of you who uh, joined maybe a little bit late, we'll be having a more in-depth lecture with Dr. Berenstein uh, on mastering porcelain veneers, which will cover things like cementation. It'll be much more in-depth. Uh, there will be CE credits uh, in, involved with uh, that lecture. It'll be on Thursday, June 24th. Um, we have recently opened, uh, moved into our new facility, so we've got a really large lecture room. So uh, while this lecture on the 24th will be uh, virtual uh, via webinar and Zoom, uh, we will have um, places for, you know, accepting some, um, some doctors in-house as well, but we'll be limited to the number based on uh, COVID restrictions. Um, but I'm going to stop sharing my screen. And uh, let's see, there are a couple of questions. Dr. Berenstein, can you see the question on the screen? No. No? No. Okay, okay. so uh, moderate to severe wear cases. What guidelines do you use in choosing crown versus veneers in desi uh, desi desired increased tooth length, tooth length, assuming tooth structure is sound? How much length can one add if history of or bruxism using veneers for both strength reasons and managing translucency challenges on of the longer incisals? Yes, I think I <clears throat> understand that's a long question and it's an, it's an important question. And uh, I think what, what you're asking is, and this is certainly something I would feel more comfortable actually seeing a case, but a couple of millimeters is probably tops in my uh, feeling about a veneer going down, uh, extending on the incisal. Would you say that? I wouldn't want to go any further than that. If, if I had to go further than that, <clears throat> I would have to be start to think about doing crowns so I could get better uh, better strength at the incisal because you have much more bulk of material at the incisal um, if it's if it's not supported. If you remember back to that picture, uh, those see, there wasn't much enamel on those uh, teeth. It just really didn't, and we're what we're we're hoping we have but we have good good support and good bonding. There's reasonable bonding to dentin. And of course uh, you have a mechanical retention because you have the sides and the overlap and everything like that. So I would say if I have to have a number, two millimeters, more than two millimeters, go to a crown. Uh, sometimes you have uh, half the tooth is broken off from a, like a, we used to call it a class four, but you know, maybe it's a mesial incisal fracture. And I've put pins into those teeth and built them up with composite and then done a veneer over that. That works. But if the entire tooth is short, no, it's gotta be a crown. It's gotta be a crown. That answered the question, uh, Dale. If, if it wasn't, please, uh, you can send us another one. Um, we have a question, it's more for, for the lab. So uh, somebody is asking what the cost of a middle temporary is for anterior six and also what a diagnostic uh, design would be. So uh, I'm happy, uh, Erickson, to share uh, our lab fees for, um, for things like that, uh, that I can email to you um, uh, after this. So. Uh, okay, John is asking, please comment on the cement that Cement that do not change color after cement. <laughs> yeah, uh, that's my wish. When I was doing veneers, that was my wish. I go to sleep at night thinking about that. Well, the, the closest we can come is we have the, the uh, trial cements, but you always have to think it's gonna be a touch darker. Now, a touch to you and a touch to me could be different amounts, but it, the, the veneers the next day are going to be not, not quite as 
light as they were, no matter what cement you use. And I think we're going to have the Ivoclar rep with us when we do that meeting. And, um, and we'll show more slides, of course. But there's no magic there. You just have to realize if you're going to aim for something with your trial cement, aim light, not, not, not perfect. Aim light because it will darken down a little bit. And that's just a tiny bit, OK? No, it's not, 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 a, not a great deal. I hope that answers the question. And, and like Dr. Berenstein said, um, we will have Ivo Clark uh, with us for the presentation in June uh, with the CE credits that will be included um, with that. And they will also be, they've offered up uh, a couple of prizes. So, uh, I mean, I can mention them here. They're going to be offering uh, a Variolink aesthetic light pure kit uh, as, well, as well as a bottle of Ivo Clean. So uh, that will be given away at uh, the lecture in June. Uh, so we've got another question. Um, are the mill temps like full coverage shell temps in that they require relining with uh, bisacarol? Yes, the question is, the answer is yes. Yes, you can't, you can't expect them to come on to go to fit. Um, I have done, I can tell you what I have done. I have done preps. And I have made chairside temps, made an impression, and had milled temps made on the preps. Sometimes they were not, maybe they in those days of maybe not milled, they were processed, but two sets of temps. Because this is part of the extra 20% that you charge for this type of cosmetic dentistry. Um, so yes, you can get them to fit, but, but you'd have to take an impression. If they come back uh, as, as we like to do them, then they will be relined. And you can reline them with um, any acrylic. And I like to use, uh, like I say, new outline. It's very strong. It will adhere to the, um, the mill temps. What, are the, what is the material of the mill temps? It's PMMA. It's PMMA. And so, so these are PMMA, PMMA too. So they will bond to it and you get a, and then you re, uh, re um, trim them. And uh, that's, a, you get a great result. It's just a great result. Yeah. Uh, Dr. Bernstein, I have a question that I got from one of our doctors uh, earlier today. Um, so may, it, you know, I, I think it might help here as well, uh, who was asking, you know, once they've tried in their, their Emacs veneers, which the lab sends to them etched, if they try them in uh, with maybe temporary cement, do they need to re-etch them? Yes. Okay. Yes. Don't fool around. <laughs> yeah. It's, it's not a big deal. You can, if you, if the lab isn't uh, hey, uh, near you or something, you can do it yourself. It's, um, it's a, just as if you were doing a porcelain repair. Right. And you would use what, the Ivoclean, the Monobond Plus, and then yeah. that? Yes, definitely. All of that. All of that. And then go to it again. Even after we... Uh, if we, oh no, well, well, you know, we're using a lot of composite cements now that we weren't using years ago. And um, when we do that, when we clean that, of, and we put that on with temporary cement, let's say temp bond and Vaseline or something like that, uh, you take the cement out, you clean it very well, and then you etch it in office etching. Definitely, before you before you re-cement with the final uh, uh, composite cement, yeah. So I think that answers that question. Yeah. Yeah. Um, so I don't see any other questions here. Um, like you know, we we keep mentioning there will be a, a more in-depth lecture in June. Uh, 
in the interim, uh, you're all welcome to connect with me via email or uh, connect with me for a live Zoom call and I can show you some of our work. If you want to see some of our uh, our work from the lab, uh, I think I mentioned it earlier, but you can uh, go to our Instagram profile and even if you don't have an Instagram account, you can just uh, visit Instagram through uh, through a website, um, through the website and uh, search for us at, at Ordana Dental. And uh, there you can see our day-to-day -day work. Um, so, you know, we'll, we share pretty regularly Regularly, you know, everything from a highly aesthetic case to, you know, a single monolithic uh, zirconia crown. Um, so you can uh, you can connect with us in, in several ways. And like I mentioned earlier, uh, you know, we are here to work with you as um, uh, collaboratively as a team. So if you want to uh, connect with uh, Gordana and Dr. Berenstein for a consult appointment. Yeah, so we can book that appointment. You can bring your patient here. You can call. You can send pictures. And uh, with any kind of technical questions, and we're 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 here to help um, help you be more confident in, in whatever restoration that you might be nervous about, or if you just want some additional support, uh, we're here for you. So we're we're here to work as a as a team collaboratively with you. Uh, so. I, that's all I have. Um, thank you very much, everyone, for uh, joining. Uh, like I said, reach out if you have any questions. Oh, wait, there's one last question. Uh, this might be one for Gordana. How many shades of uh, Vita Classic uh, can one achieve with veneers versus crowns? That's a good question. Well, and usually, <laughs> Every patient, uh, the reason why they're doing the veneers is uh, <laughs> either the spacing, the position of the teeth, but 90% they want to change the color. So the most used shade is A1, BL3, BL4. Uh, so, you know, it's, it's, a, it's, a, it's a white shade, just a white shade. I did have one patient that sticks out in my mind, and she's in the presentation as well. Uh, she, we did our upper anteriors, and um, when I put the temporaries on, the temporaries were A1. Well, she just went crazy. She literally went crazy looking at those teeth. And I think we wound up making her teeth A3.5. <laughs> she just didn't want her teeth to stand out. She wanted them to be very, very much blended with her other teeth. So you have, you have to be careful. But most patients are going to have A1 or O1 or yeah, B1 yeah. or B bleaching. Bleaching shade. Yeah, yeah. It's, yeah, it's a lot of people. Um, they try to bleach first, and uh, yeah. most of the time, what's happening is if they have the uh, the chroma stronger, they remove the chroma, but then the translucency comes uh, out more, and the teeth become gray. Mm. So, in order mm -hmm. to cover that, you know, and then uh, they're never happy with their teeth. So they realize that the, by doing the veneers, they will have stability of the color. So saying that, then we go to the bleaching shade guides. And, you know, uh, as I said, the most common is uh, uh, the uh, bleaching shade guide, like BL3, BL4, BL2, if they push the envelope to be very light. But I'm always saying like, you know, if you do that then you should really do something with the lowers, you know, if it's a huge uh, difference in color. So they would go and they would bleach the lowers. So, you know, people looking themselves in the mirror, they don't see the lower, but when we are studying the patient, we see people more showing the lower teeth uh, than the upper. So, you know, as I said, mainly mostly bleaching sheets. Yeah, we actually, we have a comment here. It's actually a, um, uh, for you, Dr. Berenstein, it's a, it's 
That's actually a really great uh, thing to hear. Listen to this. So uh, John was at a wedding a couple of years ago and the guy next to him was a very high end public TV personality. And when he heard that John was a dentist, he asked him who he thought was the best dentist in Toronto. And John said, oh, Harold Berenstein. And uh, this public uh, TV personality said, oh, I already go there. <laughs> so it was uh, it was a patient of yours. So that's a nice compliment to hear. And uh, you know, Gordana probably worked on his case with you. Yeah, we had a few uh, a few um, notables. You know, people on television. Yeah. Weather weather girls and uh, <laughs> lots of uh, people like that. Yeah. yeah. I think the coolest one was Eugene Levy. Like, I, I never got to meet him because this was. Yeah. 20 years ago, but uh, that one was cool. Um, another question uh, from Dale. Can one move from, for example, from an A3 to a B1 with veneers or do you need to do, you need to do crowns for this? <laughs> See, that's a big problem, you know? It depends on the depth of smile. And this was a really big problem. <clears throat> and I have cases to show that will that demonstrate that. You smile, and you show from the mesial of the six to the mesial of the six. And if you change the shade of the six anteriors, it looks stupid because you have this very dark background and six front teeth that are white. But can you yeah. achieve can you achieve that with a veneer? That I guess it depends a bit on the stump shape well, too. Yeah, I know lots of veneers on bicuspids and yeah. But also, also, as Dr. Berenstein mentioned in his first presentation, uh, you can't do uh, uh, reduction only 0.5. You gotta go a little bit more to give the depth and the thickness of the material. Yeah. We do have a uh, higher opacity uh, uh, material that so we need to use the, uh, uh, to cover that, but Ivocon has the material mm -hmm. that you can go over dark teeth, bond them on, like it's a pure white, uh, like opaque uh, material, but you need to bond it. And then you have to, after that, to take the impression. But saying that the reduction has to be much more, so close to a millimeter. Mm -hmm. I've never done it that way. I've never done it that way. I, I have replaced composites for sure take old yellow composites out and put in nice new white ones. And uh, that works, but I've never done the technique that, that uh, Bordana just mentioned. Yeah, well, I've, I've, we've done a few cases I, I, and the result was really good. Uh, what, you know, if you're asking me about the bonding, uh, I, I'm not too sure how, uh, you know, the quality of the bonding between the, uh, this material, mm -hmm. it's called direct uh, opaque. So you're really painting it, you know, and the, uh, yeah. so the main problem usually is the gingival turret where we need to be very thin, you know, because you don't want to over contour your uh, margins and, you know, so I've done it a few cases and uh, they looked really amazing. But you know, it's, it depends yeah. on so many things, a smile line, the amount of fillings in the teeth, the quality of the enamel. <clears throat> Each one is a, is a value judgment on its own. But that will be like more like three quarter <clears throat> crowns. Yeah, oh yeah, for sure it's a three quarter crown. There's nothing wrong with three quarter crowns. There are many, many, many three quarter crowns, reverse three quarter crowns. And I have no problem with it. Okay, well, uh, we're just about up to two. I know uh, there's lots going on with the virtual ASM. So uh, thank you, everyone. Again, we were at the virtual uh, uh, ASM this year. You can visit our virtual exhibit and uh, learn a little bit more about, about us personally, the lab. Uh, but if you have any questions after, after this uh, lecture, please feel free to reach out to me via email and I can connect uh, your questions with either Gordana or uh, Dr. Berenstein or if I can answer any depending on what the question is. So uh, thank you all for attending and uh, hopefully we chat soon. Thanks so much.